Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome back to Theory and Philosophy. Here um, today, I'm lucky enough to be joined by the author of this text, Martin Bunzel. Bunzel, with a, do you pronounce the L? Bunzel. Uh, yeah. And his most recent book, Thinking While Walking, Reflections on the Pacific Crest Trail, the Pacific Crest on the West Coast, American West Coast. Now, before jumping into that, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guignow. If you're new, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts in a way that makes them accessible. So if you're new, uh, be sure to subscribe so you can see uh, any videos I release every single week. Leave a comment so that you can be, uh, I can hear from you. I don't have the time to necessarily respond to all of your comments, but I love to see them and they really help motivate me to keep doing this. And yes, without much further ado, I'd like to briefly just introduce um, Dr. Bunzel here, who is a professor emeritus from Rutgers University, whose specialty is in the philosophy of science, who's written extensively on uh, the climate, climate change, nature, uh, questions concerning humanity's relationship to nature, relationship to history, many different questions over what I take to be quite a, quite a long career that you've been pursuing this stuff. So without taking up any more time, I welcome Dr. Bunzel to talk about thinking while walking, reflections on the Pacific Crest Trail. So Thank you, David. What, what motivated you to pursue philosophy? Who, who influenced you to get you into this field? Uh, you know, how did that happen? I was an undergraduate at the University of Minnesota, and my original interests were in the social sciences. I flipped around from, flitted from economics to psychology to anthropology, and I, in the course of doing that, I, I found that the questions that I was most interested in in all of these fields were foundational questions, questions of the assumptions that organize the field, questions to do with the basic categories that the fields operated with. And I came to realize late in my undergraduate career that those were essentially philosophical questions. And Minnesota at the time was lucky to have some key people who had been involved in the development of philosophy of science, most prominently Herbert Feigl, who was a member of the Vienna Circle. Because of anti-Semitism, when Jews fled Vienna and Berlin, philosophers, they couldn't find jobs in the Ivy League and the Midwest and the United States benefited. So there were key philosophers of science at Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota. And so I became a student of philosophy at the graduate level at what was then the most prominent center for philosophy of science, the Minnesota Center for the Philosophy of Science and focused on thinking and writing and learning about foundational issues in the social sciences. And that's really preoccupied me one way or another for the last 50 years. That's great. And how long were you teaching at Rutgers then? I spent my whole career at Rutgers. I was there for 40 years. Now I've retired. My wife teaches history at the University of California in San Diego. So I live out here with her and write full time instead of writing and teaching. No, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. And that uh, led you to the Pacific Crest Trail, which I assume played some part in motivating you to write this book, because as the subtitle or what follows the colon would suggest, you are musing, reflecting on the Pacific Crest Trail in the Western uh, United States that runs from the bottom of California, if I have my geography correct. Does it go up through Oregon? Yes, goes all the way up to the Canadian border. It goes up that Man Manning State Park. Right. So you were uh, influenced then by that trail. You're being there geographically in the, on the West Coast. How did that come about? How how were you? It, how did it, it wasn't really you? quite that planful. What I found early in my career was that uh, there are two different ways to do philosophy. At least the kind of philosophy I do, which is analytic philosophy. One is to focus very hard on the steps in an argument when you're trying to assess whether an argument is a good argument. But there's another way to do philosophy, which is to try and relax and let your mind wander and be surprised by the associations that you get. There's a 
a quote at the beginning of the book that I take from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who talks about the reveries of a solitary walker, which he wrote in 1782. And he said, I find my mind entirely free and suffer my ideas to follow their bent without resistance, resistance or control when I stroll. And I feel the same way. I sometimes drive around and think about philosophical issues. And there's nothing better than strolling to do it. And while most people hike the Pacific Crest Trail, I had no such ambitions. I just wanted to put myself on it and relax and walk and see what happened as I was stimulated by the surroundings. I didn't walk the whole trail from beginning to end. I went to different sections of it. And that was a marvelous experience, both to see it and its grandeur and to experience that grandeur and to allow myself to think about, I often came with a topic, sometimes a topic sprung into my mind when I started walking and I just followed my thinking and then wrote notes when I got home and that's pretty much the way the book evolved. That's great. And beyond uh, Rousseau, I remember pretty uh, vividly having Kant's life relayed to me, or at least some of his habits. And he always made it his duty to walk every day, to take a stroll through his little town that I don't think he'd ever left. Uh, every right. single day he would take his walk. And you compare, or you rather you contrast, as you just kind of alluded to, hiking with walking or with strolling where hiking is a thing that takes up a great deal of mental energy because you really have to be focused on what you're doing. It's almost, it's a, it's a very embodied thing. Like you have to be totally aware of what your feet are doing. You have to be totally aware of where your hands are, any other obstacles you might confront. And that takes up some kind of, uh, some of your, dare I say, intellectual power. But when you're strolling, you can kind of fall into a, a, a rhythm and you, you, as you write in the book, this rhythm is opens up a kind of opportunity to think through things, to think through arguments, to think through ideas. But as the introduction or as the first chapter would convey to any of the readers, that rhythm was very immediately disturbed by the presence of litter, which as you began on the trail, you noticed almost immediately among all these other kind of strange occurrences in the southern uh, part of the trail, it is one that is littered with litter. And what is that for you? What did, how did that take you out of that rhythm? And what does it signify more broadly with, in terms of the book, in terms of your experiences on the trail, and so on? Well, you know, I came to the trail with the idea the naive idea that um, I'm going to be in the wild, I'm going to be in nature. And when you start off the trail at Campo with the Mexican border, you look up and there are high tension electrical wires. You look to the horizon and there are uh, wind turbines. And then you look down and it's covered with litter. And so the first shock to me was I'm not in the wild. I'm actually here with some of the ugliest aspects of modern civilization, wires contaminating the nature, the horizon contaminated with turbines, and then this junk on the ground. And, um, but I immediately switched to philosophical mode and thought, well, what makes litter litter? I mean, the standard mark of an analytic philosopher is to ask, why is this category what it is? And I hadn't thought about litter before. I always, I've always been very neurotic about litter. I, I pick it up when I, when I see it. And, um, but I'd never really thought about what makes litter, nor had I thought about the history of litter. When did litter become litter? And so the first chapter is really devoted to a rather idiosyncratic meditation on the nature of litter. It's not something that we count as private. We don't speak about littering our bedroom or our living room. We speak about having a messy living room or a kitchen. It's something to do with what happens in the public space. And that gives rise to the question of our relationship to the public space. Is the public space ours in some sense? Do we share it? If we share it, do we have joint responsibility for it? How do our actions affect other actions? And that leads to a whole lot of issues about, that I take up later in the book, our relationship to nature, 
a relationship to each other, a notion of moral responsibility. And then there are metaphysical issues as well that I take up. You know, why is an orange peel not litter and a piece of paper litter? Um, and and, and, and uh, why is it something that is a facsimile of nature, uh, not nature itself? Why do we care to have this notion of pure nature? Why is that so important to us? So these are the kind of preoccupations that enter. And it's, I was quite surprised by some of the direction that it took me in. Absolutely. And I think that that characterizes it pretty well in that as far as the analytic tradition goes, you're going to be questioning the very basic assumptions that one might hold when they put forward an argument. So, for example, when you raise this issue about being in nature, as you said, throughout the course of the book or later on in the book, you come to actually ask, well, what is nature? How do we differentiate nature from the unnatural? How do, di how do we differentiate, as you say, an orange peel from a candy wrapper? They are both, to some extent, uh, some remnant of, uh, they, are, they are discarded tissue of something else that was consumed or used or whatever. And so I guess the question that I would be interested in asking you now is to, maybe think or to speak about this divide or this construction of nature between nature and between the unnatural. How do we construct this idea of nature and why does it serve some end for us? Well, I like the way you framed it in the last statement you made because you used the word construction. And most people, when they think about the category nature, think of it as natural, as given, as existing in the world independent of us. And I think it's, it comes as a shock to realize that this category of nature has a history of its own, has a history in human culture. Uh, Aristotle's use of the term nature has to do with the idea of essential properties of things. It isn't the, the modern notion of nature as something external to us, independent to us, independent of us, has a relatively recent history, really starts in reaction, I think, to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, von Humboldt talks about it, and there's a wonderful book called the, Con the, the Invention of Nature, which is an intellectual biography of von Humboldt. Von Humboldt writes that about nature, starting in the late 18th century. I'm struck, you know, that there's a, a wonderful picture in the book by William Williams, a British artist, of two young French women, I think French women, who sailed up the Severn River to a town called Coaldale in the Midlands to witness the wonder of the first coke smelting plant. And there they are in their finery looking over the hill at this factory that is belching up smoke. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, it was like a wonder. It's only a few decades later that we come to see it as a blot. And this distinction between the natural and the, quote, man-made, the industrial and the city, doesn't really arise until the 19th century. And our idea of nature as benevolent, as pure, as a paradise, as it were, in contrast to the city, the factory, doesn't arise until that period. Prior to that period, nature was viewed as a threat. And if you look at the change in how people thought about housing, certainly in Britain, prior to the Industrial Revolution, the richer you were, the thicker the walls you would be on the house, the smaller the windows to keep the threats of nature out. Yet the Victorians in the 19th century started designing houses to mimic nature, to bring nature into the house in contrast to the threats of the city. So when you take this history and you see that this idea of nature in this sense is something we construct, you can ask, what's our relationship to it? And one of the things I think that we've inherited from this distinction is the illusion, and I think it is an illusion, that we are outside nature. That there's nature on one side and human beings on the other. But of course, we're a product of nature. And everything we do is a product of nature, including our pollution of nature for good or for bad. And I think that this distinction does not serve us well because it gives rise to binaries 
that, for example, deeply affect the debate about climate change. People say, well, it's fine to use natural things to try and solve the climate change like planting trees, but it'd be wrong to use technology. But I think it's important that we stop and ask what's the difference between the quote natural and the technological. So you think that that gives rise then to a kind of anthropocentrism as though humans somehow have found a way to transcend the earth, to transcend nature as though we are floating above everything else. And it's almost like we created this category of nature following industrialization or around that period in order to make it seem as though uh, there is this space outside of the all these like constructs, which is of course, as you, I think, correctly point out, we are only ever still a part of nature. We have never left it. We are existing very much within it. And of course that raises some dilemmas into how we distinguish ourselves, for example, or any of our actions from, I believe one of the examples you use, from what an ant or an ant colony might make because they use, dare I say, tools. They use their uh, intelligence to form things that are separate from themselves that wouldn't have been formed otherwise in nature. Or maybe another example, uh, a beehive. That wouldn't have happened without bees, much like buildings probably wouldn't have happened in nature without humans. So how do we then distinguish, uh, if at all, what you know humans might do versus what these animals do? Well, you've raised a lot of issues. Let me unpack them. You began with uh, the question of anthropocentrism. And I think you're right that our relationship to nature is fundamentally anthropocentric, although we mask that by creating the illusion that we are protecting, preserving the natural as opposed to ourselves. And it comes as a shock to realize how much what we are protecting is something that we have shaped. Human beings started shaping nature 10,000 years before the Christian era when we invented or discovered settled agriculture and that began to transform nature. And our very idea of the natural is very influenced by the marks we leave on nature. I grew up in London and I used to summer in the Lake District. The Lake District for me represents nature as its most beautiful. And it comes a shock, as a shock to realize that the Lake District, which has barren low altitude hills or small mountains is barren because it was timbered and then overgrazed. It was the site of the first tourism to nature in the late 18th and 19th century as the new middle class wanted to discover nature. And when it came to conservation, it was reconstructed to preserve the look that had attracted people in the first place. So the nature we deal with is very much something we've shaped, but we live under an illusion that if we're not really being anthropocentric, we're really preserving nature. This notion of preserving nature, of freezing nature, is of course completely antithetical to what drives nature, which is natural selection, which really demands change or operates on the basis of change. So our attempts to freeze nature as we like it is very much against the grain of actually what, what, drives, what drives nature. Now you ask, a, a related question to this, uh, building on what I said earlier, that we are part of nature, we're not outside nature, and everything we do is a consequence of our relationship to nature. So as you point out in the book, I contrast the complex structures that ants build and the simple structures that we sometimes build when we build huts and ask, well, is there a difference between the two? And the more I push against that, the less I'm convinced that there is a difference. Obviously, we do things intentionally, and I don't think ants have intentionality. And obviously, we manipulate and change nature more than ants do. But I think this is much more a matter of degree than people, people realize. I'm not sure what the consequences are, except I think it has a policy consequence, again, when people complain that it's okay to manipulate nature by selective breeding, but it's not okay by genetic engineering. 
It's okay to remove carbon dioxide by planting trees, but not synthetic trees. I don't understand what the difference in kind is between selective breeding and genetic engineering, regular trees and artificial trees. There may be risks associated with the latter categories, and that's important to investigate, but I don't think there's a difference in kind involved in it. Yes, and I think that that raises another dilemma, or maybe, and I think that you were hinting at this, a kind of fear of, or technophobia, maybe a science phobia. And I've, I've seen this argument or this sentiment sort of echoed in the following way or spoken in the following way, where people frame nature as a harmonious place where there's just gonna be a kind of natural order and everything will be perfectly fine. But at another point in the book, you make it very clear that there are species that will very much encroach upon other species, environments, other species, uh, places in the world, and will have deleterious, really negative consequences on an entire ecosystem. And we don't seem to look at that and say, oh, well, look at the harm being done by the species. We, you know, some people might, not in the same way that we might speak about humans doing it. So here, this is just... I think in, in part just echoing what you said about how do we draw this distinction between you know what humans do versus what seems to always be happening in nature. And we would really be kind of naive to think that there is this perfect harmony within nature, this wonderful circle of life where everything will just maintain a balance when no, extinction is very much possible in nature without humans. Um, the uh, kind of destruction of wildlife is very much uh, at risk without humans, you know, where something like that might seem bad, like planned burns of forests, for example, or parts of forests, while it might look bad, is actually a way to ensure longevity of the broader forest at large. And here we are, you know, how do we then assess, well, this amount of forest is good to burn for the greater good, while potentially risking worse effects if we didn't do anything in the first place. And I may have thrown a lot at you there, but just, I'm really just chewing into this. Well, there's a good, there's a good topics, but again, you, you do raise a lot of things. Let's begin at the beginning. I think the remark you made about the assumption people have that nature is harmonious flies in the face of the way natural selection works and the fact that Nature itself does not have interests. Nature does not care what the outcomes are. Nature doesn't care whether life exists or life goes extinct, whether smallpox becomes a dominant virus, whether the beetles eat the trees. We care about it, but nature itself doesn't care about it. So I think, that, and I think it's naive to think that, uh, as you again point out, if we simply step back, uh, nature will keep things in balance. There's no guarantee that nature will not itself precipitate a tipping point in a runaway situation with disastrous consequences. I mean, some people believe that there was, maybe there may have been life on Venus, but if there was life on Venus, it eventually resulted in a runaway situation in which all of the water in, in Venus bo boiled away. We come to nature with preferences. We prefer trees over beetles. And we feel empowered to intervene to save trees and extinguish beetles. I have a tongue in cheek section in the book in response to people who have a very expansive notion of the rights of species in which I talk about my representation of the virus liberation executive, speaking on behalf of viruses and bacteria. Not let me assure your listeners because I believe viruses have rights, but I think that when people assert that all living things have rights, they should be held to the test and be willing to defend the idea that if viruses are living or bacteria, which certainly live, then they too have rights. We favor, I think, status quo living forms as if the status quo is special compared to what will come if the status quo leaves the scene and new living forms mutate. And I think it merits thinking, why do we favor the status quo? We favor the status quo again, because in the end, I think we have anthropocentric interests. We like the status quo. Well, 
that's wrong. We would be happy to see cockroaches go extinct, I'm sure, just as smallpox. But I think we realize there's a danger in engaging in selective deliberate extinction. But I don't, again, understand the moral priority that current species have over others. And one of the things I struggle with in this book again and again is whether or not it's possible to take a non-anthropocentric stance towards nature, because I think the anthropocentric stance is ultimately, as, as you pointed out in a discussion with me before we did this recording, a very shaky basis on which to try and ground our relationship to nature because our anthropocentric interests may change. Take teenage children, they don't care too much about nature. Suppose a whole generation of teenage children arise and never mature. They'll be totally indifferent to nature. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it really, it gets me thinking about it as well. But in your previous comment, you'd mentioned a distinction between genetic engineering and selective breeding and how uh, you mentioned in the book, how there is kind of a fear of potentially uh, genetically modified organisms, colloquially GMOs, because you know they're not natural, so to speak. When we know quite well that, and I can't speak to the science on it, but I can say that GMOs are an excellent way to make sure people do not starve. Yet there's still some, some fears about it because who knows, maybe a conspiracy theory encouraged them to, to not like GMOs because it's used for government or used by governments for controlling the population, whatever. So do you see then a kind of fear, this fear of science, this fear of technology spilling over into a fear of genetic engineering as well, as opposed to selective breeding, where we see selective breeding as being ben beneficial, being better for people than uh, genetically, uh, genetic engineering? Well, I think we need to distinguish between the grounds that people have for the fears that they have and whether or not there are defensible reasons to favor one kind of intervention over another. There's some wonderful research done by Slovic and Associates about 30 years ago on the psychological perception of risk, which shows, I think quite convincingly, that we consider the new more risky than the old. The things we are familiar with are what we assumed to be safe. And we engage in distortions because of that when you compare how people rate riskiness versus objective risk involved. So people think that um, working with chainsaws is less risky than being hit by satellite debris, but the statistics show just the opposite to be the case. That has an interesting effect which we can trace all the way back to examples in the 19th century with the development of the telegraph, which had wires going through cities and, and the countryside, of course. And people were afraid of it. People were afraid of the telephone because it was new. So there's a reason psychologically people will be afraid of genetic engineering over selective breeding because it's new. That's ill-founded. However, I do think there is an objective reason to say that genetic engineering is objectively riskier than selective breeding simply for the following grounds. Selective breeding places restrictions on what you can do because you can't introduce radically different components of the gene pool from different species into existing species by genetic breeding because you have, they have to be able to breed with each other. There are no such restrictions in genetic engineering. So you can do ra make radical changes in genetic engineering. So in theory, the potential risk is greater because the change you can make is greater. However, we now have about 40 years of history of genetic engineering. We've objective data on the degree to which it can spread both to uh, domesticated crops and wild crops. And that data shows that yes, there are spreads that are possible. The spreads are quite limited when it comes to wild strains of food crops. And the incidence of untoward consequences is essentially zero. So I think that 
there is an argument to be made that there is at least a potential risk that is greater. And here, I think the data can be a guide. We have experience and the experience can lead us to judgments to quantify that risk. And as you point out, the benefits of genetic engineering, I think far outweigh any potential risk. And that's especially true in the area of climate change, because there's some interesting research going on uh, here actually in La Jolla at the Salk Institute to genetically engineer food crops to improve their uptake of carbon dioxide, storing the carbon dioxide in the root systems of those plants in a molecule named subrin, which is a um, part of cork that is resistant to decay for hundreds of years. Now, you know, if it turns out that you could reduce, remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere by using food crops genetically engineered in this way, there are tremendous benefits, benefits for farmers who would earn money, benefits for reducing carbon dioxide. And even if there is a potential risk in genetic engineering in this way, I think the cost benefit analysis certainly favors engaging in that. Yes, I would, I, I would certainly agree. And one of the ways that that would be beneficial as well, especially in Canada, where there are many populations of people, specifically Indigenous people and First Nations people who live in areas that are very difficult to cultivate crops in much, in much colder climates, having these abilities to uh, genetically modify organisms for any purpose, be they to extend their uh, shelf life so that they can actually be transported from a city from a place where they're grown to somewhere else so that they won't go bad in order to feed people, I think would be, uh, would be a, gr a great thing as well. Um, and I wanted to ask about something specific in chapter four, and I meant to bring this up just a few moments ago, but you discussed the way that nature is almost, to go back to the idea of it's being constructed, but it has to be maintained. And there are deliberate efforts made by humans to maintain nature in some way or other, to try to make it uh, so that it adheres to our expectations of it, which is seems totally uh, ridiculous if we subscribe to a notion of nature being like a thing that is uh, self, it preserves itself, it is self-regulating, it is autopoietic, but yet we still feel like we have to infringe upon it and to give it the, some kind of order which begs the question to some extent, how much of that order of nature comes from itself or is it something imposed upon it by us? Well, that chapter is, is based on uh, my walking around Yosemite and Yosemite is um, probably the, the preeminent case of an attempt to preserve, preserve nature and preserve nature in a, in a particular way. Uh, I recently discovered, I hadn't known about it before, that John Muir actually engineered the expulsion of indigenous people from Yosemite because he had an idea that not only should nature be preserved, but it should be preserved without contamination by human beings in a pure form. <laughs> uh, I don't think the people lived permanently there. I think they were nomadic, but part of their annual movement took them through Yosemite and. He didn't like the way they made Yosemite look with the kind of leavings of human beings when they live in nature. And there is now a debate going on about Yosemite in which the people in charge of it, the rangers are saying, we cannot keep all of the species in Yosemite the way they are because climate change is driving change. Of course, Yosemite has a history of radical change. In the Ice Age, it was totally different. And the Ice Age forged it in large part the way it is. And in the long durée, in the long arc of time, Yosemite will change. There's no way we can, we can stop it. But I think that our picture of nature is derived from certain paradigm instances of it. And so ideas like in the United States, Yosemite, Yellowstone, the Matterhorn in, in Europe, uh, parts of the Canadian Rockies. They are so central to our idea of nature that we're especially fixed on keeping those exactly the way they are. 
there is the contradiction that you cleverly pointed out that that's inconsistent with the idea that nature is self-regulating it and can keep itself stable. Of course, that's an illusion, but it's also an illusion to think that we can keep control of nature in this way, never to stop it, never to stop it, 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 it changing. And of course, um, you know, now you see the sort of frantic, the frantic efforts to correct the changes we've made here in Southern California or in California in general, as country byways became highways, milkweeds, which grew naturally along those roads and supported monarchs have become hard to find. And we've got a crash in the monarch population. So now we are frantically planting mil milkweeds in California, but it's not clear that milkweeds can be sustained with the climate change that's going on. I think the cost is going to be that the monarchs will no longer be around in, in California. And that will be a tragedy from an anthropocentric point of view. But as I said earlier, you know, nature will be entirely indifferent to the disappearance. Yes, absolutely. And that raises a point that I think is kind of the elephant in the room when we're talking about nature, and that is climate change. So at the beginning of this talk, we were, you know, we kind of briefly mentioned the difficulty in distinguishing what humans do and what animals do in terms of their impact on the earth. But there's no denying that humans have a very specific impact that, at least according to uh, scientific consensus, is having very clear deleterious effects on the planet, on other species, and on ourselves. So how does climate change figure into your book, your approach, your musings on the uh, Pacific Crest Trail? Well, I think on the Pacific Crest Trail, you'd have to be blind to not to notice the effects of climate change. You know, the bark beetles that are killing off millions of trees along the trail now reproduce twice a year. And that's the consequence of climate change. And when you reproduce twice a year, since it's an exponential function, the consequences are disastrous. So we have hundreds of millions of trees that are dying as, as a result of that. Uh, I, I think that, you know, in the end, the solution to climate change depends on a reduction in human population. And I think the paradox is a reduction in human population requires increasing the wealth of human beings because people have fewer children when their family household income goes up, particularly if it's under the control of female householders. But economic wealth requires energy, in, especially in underdeveloped countries. That's how those countries become richer. And one of the things I write about in the book is what I think of as an illusory way in which people propose to solve the climate change, which is if we just try hard enough, we can get rid of fossil fuels today and take care of all of our energy needs with renewable energy tomorrow. Al Gore promulgated this myth in 2008 when he said the United States could become totally fossil fuel free in 10 years. Well, that turned out to be a fat chance. And even, Gre even Greta Thunberg, who you know, is a wonderful young person, when she stamps her foot and just say, you adults solve the problem, I think she's blind to history that it takes about 75 years to make an energy transition. It took 75 years to get from wood to coal, from coal to oil, from oil to gas. And it's going to take 50 to 75 years to get to a fully renewable portfolio, especially when you consider that prospective energy demand is largely going to come from the so-called underdeveloped world. One of the things I write about in the book is if you were a, a person living in the third world, in the underdeveloped world and poor, living on a household income of $1,000 per person in your family in terms of parity purchasing, it's not clear if you have a choice between economic growth and the risk to future generations that you should forgo the economic growth because the economic growth is going to increase the probability that your children will survive and their children will survive. 
And why is it not reasonable for those poor people to say, you know, I want a washing machine because it will radically free me to earn money. I want an electric bicycle. I want a refrigerator. And the problem is if we look at the kind of musings of first world climate people who say, well, we can give up our excess consumption. There aren't enough of us around. There are 7.8 billion people in the world, 6.5 billion of them are poor. If we give up everything and give it to them, it still won't be enough. So I think we have a tremendous problem, you know, it, as a philosopher and therefore a skeptic and a cynic, I wish I could wave my hand and reduce the population to 3.5 billion tomorrow because then things would be a lot easier. I, I do think we, we are shot through with paradoxes in our behavior. You know, we try and save people's lives. We extend, we want to extend life expectancy. Um, we should save people's lives. It's not very fair to reduce population by letting people with HIV or malaria die. And maybe there's a more equitable way to see population reduced over time. But again, the paradox is one way to do it is by increasing economic wealth and that's going to make the climate problem worse. All of this leads me to believe that whatever we do, we are going to have to develop ways to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for thousands of years. Once you get to 20% of what we've put up there, that 20% takes thousands of years to come out of the atmosphere. And so not only have we changed the climate and therefore the globe more radically than we have doing anything else over the last 12,000 years, in order to correct it, we really have to do something very dramatic. And that is not easy. You can't wave your hand and say, well, we can do that too if we want to. We don't have the technology to do it efficiently. With current technology, it would actually take about a third of global GDP to build the capacity to remove that amount of carbon dioxide. I'm dubious about whether that's gonna happen. Without it happening, 80% of species are going to go extinct by the end of this century. Human beings will be all right. Poor people won't be, they will die. But people in the Northern hemisphere, mainly white people, the rich, they will be okay and they will propagate the species. We'll rebuild our towns inland and we'll proceed as normal. So it's a very dystopian scenario, I think. Um, but I'm by naturally, I'm by, by nature pessimistic. So maybe you shouldn't take my dystopian scenario at face value. Well, it'd be, it's something I certainly agree with, especially when we consider the ways that privilege works, how the allocation or the um, distribution of wealth functions currently as being you know, wealth mostly owned by the minority of the population, primarily in the West, uh, white people. And it's this is one of the catch 22s of climate change in that dealing with it is often framed as, a, as, as you said, it is a matter of us cutting back on what we're doing, which is also extended to those populations that don't have the privilege to cut back. Because if you're just struggling to survive, you can't exactly cut back on any kind of means you're using to get through your day to feed a family you might have or to, you know, loved ones or, or, or whatever. Yet dealing with climate change because it puts that onus on those people, uh, if climate change, I should say, is not dealt with, it will also negatively affect those people because they are going to be the ones that are going to be most affected by climate change with rising uh, sea levels, with increased sun exposure through um, the presence of carbon carbon dioxide in the in the atmosphere. All of these effects, you know, more harsh um, uh, weather weather systems are going to affect people who do not have the privilege to just get up and go wherever they want if they had the money to do so, if they had the resources to do so. And you raise this as well. So I guess this is kind of a two part comment where you say that one possible solution is to lime the ocean, but this comes at a certain cost in that it will result in immediate uh, issues. And this is the connecting thread here is kind of dealing with the catch 22 of dealing with climate change, where we can do this thing, lime the oceans, but it will take so many resources and we'll have 
kind of immediate negative effects on wildlife in the oceans, not to mention other human populations that might live on those oceans, people who are dependent upon them. And so how do we begin then, I guess, to deal with this issue, this catch-22 of dealing with, with climate change, if, you know, so solve the issue for us? Uh, uh, to... Thanks a lot. I think the philosophical subtext here that is worth bringing out into the open is that we have a inclination to believe there is a morally relevant difference between not acting and acting. Let's, uh, let's reprise a, a, a famous kind of philosophical thought experiment in, in this. Uh, we think that there is a moral difference between drowning someone and failing to save someone who's drowning. In philosophers call this a distinction between negative duties and positive duties. And there's good philosophical grounds to believe that that is a, an important distinction. If a child is drowning in the ocean and there are many people around, it only takes one of them to save the child. If a child is standing there and only any one of us can go and drown that child deliberately. So it's important for all of us to be under a dictate a negative dictate that we are not to interfere with the freedom of others, but we live with a weaker prescription that it would be good for any or all of us to act altruistically to save people. Uh, so we live in a society. We live in a society with a, with a kind of moral belief that not interfering is very important. Uh, acting positively is a good thing to do, and that I think translates into. A, a bad extension of that in the area of climate. We, we somehow think, and this goes back actually to what's known as the doctrine of double effect, which is a medieval theory. We somehow think that deliberately killing off a species would be bad, but inadvertently killing off a species when you didn't really know you were doing it, but you might've should have known that you were doing it, that's not as bad. So because of the industrial revolution and all the things we've done, we're having effects on species, but we didn't know it was going to happen. We didn't intend it to happen. If we now try and correct what we've done by liming the oceans, we will drive some species in the oceans to extinction for the greater good, to save other species. And when you talk to people, non-philosophers about this, they think that's somehow worse than what's going on now. How could we set out on a course of action that we know will actually eliminate species. I think that's a bad philosophical argument for many different reasons. I don't think fish have rights, but even if they did have rights, you know, I, I'm willing to contemplate a kind of consequentialist consideration in which one would embrace that. I'm willing to sacrifice the rights of one to save 7 billion people, as it were. That's a whole controversial discussion we can put off for now. But I do think that in a way, this is less a philosophical question or more a biological question. There are certain species where if they go extinct, there are many, many other species which depend on them, which will go extinct as well. There are other species where if they go extinct, the knock-on consequences are much more limited. And so I think when we consider alternative courses of action, we should look at this from a cold biological point of view, rather than I think a pseudo philosophical view. I think that that's a, a very good point uh, because it, it feels a lot worse when we know exactly it is our immediate actions that are producing this negative effect. And so we'd rather things run on their course. Exactly. And have everyone suffer and have all the wildlife on earth suffer uh, brutally because we can wipe our hands of it and say it, it just happened on its own you know, as, as a way to kind of neutralize our, um, our uh, responsibility. And, and let me just say that for your, for your listeners, if you want a, a, a closer to home example of that, there's a wonderful famous paper by James Rachels arguing that there is no morally relevant distinction between a doctor letting someone die for benevolent reasons and killing them for benevolent reasons. And yet we live day to day, I don't know about Canada, but here in the United States and in Europe with the idea that there is a morally relevant distinction between letting someone die for benevolent reasons for their own good and killing them for their own good. 
it's very hard to make a philosophically compelling reason that there's a morally relevant difference between these two. Yes, absolutely. And I think that 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 encourages me now to pose the question, and this is something that you wrestle with in the book, why should we care? If, you know, if it's not going to affect me, let's say climate change is not something that's going to affect me in my lifetime, what obligation do I have to care about climate change? And you raise this issue and say, well, there are camps of people who might say or might refer to there being a God, for example. And they say, well, God has given this to us. So therefore it is for that reason we must be good to nature or else we won't be seen well in the eyes of God. And you don't want to have anything to do with those arguments because obviously they're just, it's just pure reason. You know, we have no way of knowing if there is a God. We have no way of knowing if God has any stake, even if there was a God in this thing called nature. So what, how do we, or maybe my, my question then is, what is this issue and how do we figure out why we should care? Should, well, and great. how do you approach that? Well, let me approach it sideways first with a related question, which your list may occur to your listeners because it may occur to them to say, well, what about future generations? Uh, in our discussion so far, we've been trying to avoid anthropocentrism and relying on our obligation to future generations continues the anthropocentrism. We're doing it for our own kind. Um, let's bracket that for the purpose of argument and frame the question, we want to know if we have a duty to respect nature that is not based on human beings, because we want to allow that it should be robust enough to resist the preferences of human beings. And for all we know, there may be no future generation. We may destroy the planet so there is no future generation. And if you're really hard noise and you, you don't think that potential people have rights, only real people have rights, if we destroy the future generations, they've no one we've screwed in the future generations because there is no future generation. I call that the extinction paradox, by the way. If we destroy the planet, we've done no wrong because there's no one we've wronged. If we leave it really screwed up, but not destroyed, then we've wronged them. That can't be right. Okay, so now to your central question. Do we have a duty to nature if we don't rely on a belief in God? I, I struggled, I have struggled with this a lot and I can't make sense of it because I can only make sense of it if I give nature moral standing and I don't see how to give nature moral standing. And I say that because I think in order to have moral standing, you have to have certain kind of attributes. And the shorthand attribute is that you have to have a capacity for awareness, because I think a capacity of awareness is essential for things to matter to you. This chair that I'm sitting on doesn't care how it's treated. There's nothing like it is to be this chair. It has no interest. A bacterium has interests. It has biological interests in reproduction but it doesn't care if it's prevented from, reprodu from reproducing. It's not there crying at home with its bacterial family saying, oh, they wouldn't let us have babies. It doesn't care, it's completely indifferent whether it exists or goes extinct. And things get even worse if you talk about nature as a grand object, including both the animate and the inanimate. How can it have interest in that sense? So if I'm not gonna ground it on God and I'm not gonna ground it on on the rights of nature, what do I do? Well, here's where I had a, 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 a really um, surprising insight as I was walking the trail in the Northern Cascades, just south of the Canadian border. Just amazingly beautiful terrain. If you've never been there, I would encourage all of your listeners to go there. It's just shocking. It was an epiphany that I had as I was crying. I was, I was moved to tears by the beauty and I was filled with a sense of awe. And from that sense of awe, I was filled with a sense of humility. Of, you know, I, it sounds mawkish. My smallness compared to the grandeur of nature. And I thought to myself, you know, this is, this is nuts. I'm trying to get a top-down argument from first principles in philosophy to the notion of an obligation and a duty to nature, and I can't make it work. And here I am just standing here, exposing myself to nature, and it's evoking in me a feeling of 
humility of all of a notion that I have to be, I have to tread softly here, not because of a duty, but because it makes me want to. And I thought, well, you know, this is a classic example of the triumph of a kind of Eastern philosophy over Western philosophy. The Western philosophy starts from those principles, it's individualistic, and, and I'm caught in that trap. And if I set aside thinking, the title of the book, Thinking by Walk, by Strolling, Thinking by Walking, and simply allow myself to experience, I will arrive at what I want to. And that was a, a surprising insight for someone as rigid and analytic and, 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 and reason-based as I am. And then, but then I took another step. I thought, well, yeah, well, not everyone is gonna walk these and, you know, think of teenagers walking it or it's sort of akin to someone say, says, why should I be moral? It's very hard to give a person an argument about why they should be moral if they stamp their foot and said no. But then I started thinking about it in a completely different direction and a parallel direction, which is that in addition to this analytic orientation, which I fall prey to, I also fall prey to an illusion that most of us fall prey to, which I think that I am the master of my own thoughts, the master of the content of my own thinking. And we give short shrift to the idea that much of what we think about, and certainly the categories in which we think, are the result of social processes that we absorb. The content of our brains is much less ours than we would like to think. It's much more the result of social processes. And that it's not as though everyone has to walk the Pacific Crest Trail and no Northern Cascades to experience all. We can dream of a society that might come to espouse those values and inculcate those values in all of the people who live in the society so that they take that attitude of their relationship to nature, not by reason and not by individual thinking or individual experience, but by a social process in which the society comes to express these values. And people naturally absorb that as they're growing up. And that goes very much against the, the, the kind of obsessive individualist libertarianism of the United States that is shot through in discourse in the United States. A discourse, by the way, that is itself completely romantic because it has nothing to do with the reality of the expectations of what people have, that the society should help them when they need it. And so I think particularly in the United States, less so in Canada, and particularly in some parts of Europe, we have a long way to go to try and transform our relationship to nature in the way that, at least I think in this last chapter, needs to be done if we want to respect nature without looking for a deductive argument to get us there. That was it's great. That's... Very well put, I think. Um, is, there, is there anything else that you, you think is worth mentioning about the book, about any arguments you thought were worth uh, <laughs> maybe elaborating on or because no, that anyway, was- We didn't disagree great. much in this process. <laughs> no, well, the, you know, to, to be quite frank, I, I know very little about these well, discussions. Well, you very well, it's a uh, question. <laughs> Yeah, but um, no, I think we've covered it. I, how much? How many? How long are your, your podcasts? About about yeah, this well, length, but uh, there's really. Um... I, I mean, that's the most important point, and I think that's a nice point to to end with. So I don't think a need to. I don't see a need to to drop things in. That's fine. Yeah. Well, it, in in that case, uh, yeah. thank you very much, Martin, for joining me. Uh, I'm, I would really recommend anyone who's interested in this stuff to check out the book because a lot of these arguments are drawn out in a lot more detail and a lot of the current scientific, philosophical, economic, political, social uh, theories that Martin uses are, are put on full display and it will help you develop a very strong understanding of these current debates. So I'm going to extend a thanks for you coming on to discuss this with me and I look forward to any kind of comments that, that we might get or any encouraging uh, feedback that I'm sure you will appreciate as well. And if anyone has anything, of course, if you want to say, you know how to do it. And 
I'll catch you next time. Thank Take you care. Thank you for inviting me. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.